Divine Truth Assistance Group Group Assistance Sessions Putting Principles of Divine Truth into Action This recording is from the Understanding God's Loving Laws Group and is part of an Education in Love series. In the Love and Truth Principles presentation, Jesus briefly summarizes God's principles of love and truth that govern the operation of God's laws gives examples of the way these principles are built into God's laws and answers audience questions about the principles. Recorded on the 19th of November, 2016, in New Seville, Queensland, Australia. Next discussion, obviously, is love and truth principles. We're going to discuss two principles in 40 minutes, 20 minutes each. Unfortunately, it's not the time they deserve because they are the highest in hierarchy of all principles. So, so the reality is they deserve probably the maximum amount of time. But to be frank with you, I've already spoke, spoken about them for eight years with you. So by now, you're beginning to understand some of them. So uh, we feel that's the reason why we've, we've shortened it in this presentation, because we really feel these are two principles that we've focused our attention on for the last eight years. So let's look firstly at the love principles. Let's look at a summary. We want to see how love principles envelop God's creation, like, like an envelope, actually. They, they surround all of God's creation. They surround, in fact, every principle and law as well. So remember we had the, the principles. Just as there are a hierarchy of laws, so too there is a hierarchy of principles. And the love principle happens to be the highest of the hierarchy. However, it cannot exist without truth. So therefore, you could also say love and truth principles joined are the highest of the hierarchy. So that also means that every time you're not speaking the truth or you're out harming the truth, you are breaking every single law every single law so this ensures this love principles ensures that love governs all the principles so there being a hierarchy of principles love governs all the other principles the other principles could not exist in fact and would not be in the form they currently are without love governing them it also ensures that love is enforced, compelled and upheld. Guaranteed, the majority of you had some problems with that statement. Yes? No? <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> because we don't see the term enforced or compelled in harmony with love, do we? We think love lets us decide. There's a major fundamental flaw in your understanding of love, if you believe that. Love, in fact, compels. It doesn't, it enforces. You, believe it or not, while you're a free will being, every time you decide to do something out of harmony with love, love itself is already compelling you in the opposite direction. And there's a whole heap of systems that come into play that actually get you to correct your unloving choice or decision. So love is going to be upheld and compelled in your future at some point. Interesting thought, right? See, this is where many of us with children, we think, oh, you know, I, was, I had all these laws at home and I had all these things I had to do. Mum and Dad forced me to do all these things. So how I'm going to bring up my child is I'll just let them do what they want. Now, those parents who have tried that form of parenting <laughs> end up with two or three or four little disasters on their hand by the time they're five years of age. And by the time they're 20 years of age, they're often maniacs and even sociopaths. Right? Because the reality is that a loving person would not do that. A loving person provides loving guidelines and a loving framework for their creations. Remembering, of course, that your children are not 
your creations, but rather God's. So God has provided a loving framework for children to exist and abide by. So love is going to be enforced and upheld by this principle. It's going to ensure that love is the thing that governs the universe. There is no option of anarchy in this universe. There's only the illusion of it. And many of us are still in that illusion, actually, because we don't agree with that principle. All creations, so that principles ensure that all creations experience God's love in different degrees. So right from the smallest infinitesimal particle, right the way through to the human soul, everything actually experiences, and you can't say that they are all aware of the experience, because only a self-aware being can be aware of an experience, but love, all creation, experiences God's love in different degrees. Without God's love, in fact, the creation itself could not exist. And no creation could exist. Right from the smallest particle, right the way up to the human soul. So all creation experiences God's love. And all creation demonstrates and facilitates the flow of God's love in some way. And, and we, we can discuss this in more detail in some examples. But the, the reality is that if you examine any creation, any creature, in, its, in a relative point of isolation, which of course is very difficult to do, given the fact that we are all observers that influence the outcome of any choice, and that applies to the human soul in particular. But, but if you examine creation and see what it does, it automatically works in harmony to restore the most loving condition. Right? And this is something that's demonstrated in all of God's creation. And to be honest with you, that even applies to a disease that's inside of your, so inside of your physical body. It's working to restore a loving condition. The disease is, is demonstrating to you, consistently in fact demonstrating to you. So every disease has a permanent, consistent cause. One disease of one type has the same cause every single time. And this demonstrates to us when we have a disease that we're out of harmony with some issue of love. Right? So even a disease is trying to demonstrate and facilitate your understanding of love. Right? Important to understand these things. And the human soul can enter a love-based relationship with God based on this principle. In fact, if the love principle didn't exist at all, then how can we ever have a flow of emotion that we call love? There would be no such thing as a relationship that's based on love, and there'd be no such thing as a potential relationship with God without it either. So the love principle is extremely... Well, it's, of, it's the pinnacle of all importances with regard to principles. So there's the love principle. Let's have a look at the examples. Gravity. Okay, what do we know about gravity very much? Yep, no? Right. Let's, let's look at a few basic things about it. How big is the Earth? Kilometres in circumference? Earth, circumference... 4,000, 40,000 and 75 k's apparently. Okay. It rotates, one, one point on the Earth rotates every 24 hours. So if we divide that by 24, we get kilometres per hour, don't we? Of course we do. So that ends up with 1,670 kilometres per hour, around about, at the circumference. Of course, right at the top here, it's zero. Isn't it? If you could stand there, you'd just go... <laughs> and it would feel very slow as well, wouldn't it? Because it'd be one hour, one hour, one hour, one hour. But at the circumference, obviously, it's spinning. It's spinning at that speed. So imagine now you're standing at the equator and no such thing as gravity exists. And you're travelling at 1,670 kilometres an hour in a centrifugal force. <laughs> So what's going to happen? Given the laws of physics, you're going to fly off the Earth at a perpendicular a at, at, a, at the angle that it's spinning. Of course, it's just going to fly off 
straight out into space at 1,670 kilometres an hour. Right? Now, if you're doing that, well, if there is an atmosphere still, you might fly up a fair way and then come back down, right? which obviously would result in your death. But if there was no atmosphere, because the law of gravity actually provides the atmosphere, there's no atmosphere, then what would you do? You'd fly off into outer space, bang, dead, instantly. Imagine popping out of the womb. <laughs> You're gone. Wouldn't be too pleasant an experience for your first experience, would it? <laughs> uh, so you can see uh, the law of gravity obviously provides a loving environment. You can see without that, the environment would be extremely harsh, would it not? So just that one law provides a loving environment so that your physical body can survive and exist and exist with a relative degree of comfort. Now, the gravity itself is a force. It's a pulling, pulling force back. And it's a, it's a, it's a force that's a, it's an accelerative force. So, so it's measured in metres per second squared. Does anyone know what it is? 9 point? Well, it actually varies. Yeah. The average is 9.81 or something metres per second squared. Second squared. But, but at the circumference, it's actually 9.76. Right? And at the end here, it's actually 9.83 metres per second. Why is that? Because it's spinning. And this, provide, this centrifugal force lessens the accelerative force of gravity. Right? But anyway, it's spinning, and the average speed is 9.8 metres per second. That means if one, meter go, one second goes past, 9.8 metres will have done. And if two seconds go past, given if we're in a, in a vacuum, right, it's going to be more than that, isn't it? Because it's per second squared. Right? So these are the forces that we're on, on now. How does this force get created? Now you're talking about some very, very complicated things. The law of gravity is actually a combination of billions of laws working in harmony, each one with a successive, uh, what you'd call hierarchy, that actually ends up forming the law of gravity. Right? So here we have just a very simple law that we've referred to many times before, not seeing that it's actually highly complex, and it also forms this beautiful environment in which we can live and breathe. Right? And interestingly enough, it creates a lot of other things too for us. It even creates our weather, our weather systems. So you could say it even formulates the engine of how the Earth functions through pulls from the gravitational field of the sun and the moon. And obviously the sun provides energy as well, but, but with, even if it did provide energy, but if there was no gravitational force, then of course the tides would not go up and down. There's a whole lot of functional things that would occur, uh, that currently occur on Earth that would not occur. Very complicated, actually, law, given that it's a physical one, and yet it's one of the lowest of God's laws in terms of what we refer to. Obviously it's not one of the lowest physically, it's one of the highest physically because it governs so many things. Let's look at the law of aerodynamics. Do we know much about aerodynamics? Yeah, no? Aerodynamics is really a, a, a subset law. It's not really the law of aerodynamics, it's fluid dynamics, uh, which, which governs aerodynamics, and, and the atmosphere being the fluid, if you like. Right. So it's really a subset of fluid dynamics, but we'll call it aerodynamics for the sake of just referring primarily to flight. Oops, I'll just go out of the way. We'll talk more about uh, what governs the four forces of flight in the truth principles. But you can see with aerodynamics, the love in it is that it gives me a possible experience which exceeds my gravity-bound state. So normally I'd be stuck to the earth and it's only my own mode of mo movement 
that is going to mo determine where on the earth I am. And unless I have some device, like a car or something like that, I am going to have be quite limited in that movement. You know, how far can you walk in a day? Really, that's how limited you will be in your movement. But if I get in a car and I have a device that I've now created, I can travel further, can I not? But I'm still bound by the sea. So I still can't move me on the sea. But then I have to have a car and a boat, and then I'll get to another place on the planet. But if you add up the time of a car and a boat, you're talking like significant amounts of time, aren't you? Given the fact that f traveling through water with a boat has a limited speed, are you going to have a significant amount of your time eaten up if you wanted to go to another country? And, and none of that going to other countries would be really quite a difficult thing. You'd have to really give it some thought, wouldn't you? In terms of your planning and what you're going to do and how long it's going to take you and all the different perils that could be involved in that process as well. So what does is, what is aerodynamics give me? It gives me some freedom. More freedom than I had before. And it, helps me, it, has, it allows me to have an exper experiential thing that actually creates quite a lot of joy. Besides the ooh and the ah looking out the window and looking at the earth, there's also the joy that you can go from one place to another with quite a at quite a speed. Within a day, you, you can pretty much get to most places in the world from where you are. Two days at the outset and you'll be pretty much there any, from anywhere else. Now that increases and enhances the joy, does it not, of life. So can you see that aerodynamics is really uh, demonstrates that God wants you to experience joy by knowing a greater law? So can you see the love in that? The desire to want you to have a greater experience. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm already behind time, but so let's give one more example. Let's just skip to, uh, we go to the decompensation example. Law of compensation. Law of compensation, very complex law. Like uh, there's billions and billions of components to the law of compensation, but we'll just look at some of its effects. The compensation law lets me know when love has been upheld or when love has been compromised by my attitudes, emotions, thoughts or actions. And remember, attitudes, emotions, thoughts are all energy flowing. The law, God's laws all operate on energy. They all measure energy. So they can measure your thoughts. All of God's laws measure your thoughts. They measure your feelings. They measure your attitudes because they can measure the energy component. And there is actually a mathematical formula for every single emotion you can experience. Right? And that's how it measures it. It measures it through these mathematical conditions. But compensation lets me know, because of a feeling that I have that starts getting generated in me that's out of harmony with happiness, I, I'm, I'm informed when I've broken a law through that feeling. But also the feelings that get generated that are in harmony with happiness right, tell me when I'm living or probably living in more harmony with the law. Isn't that a loving thing? To, to actually guide you by your feelings. Right? Now we're not talking about your addictions, which is a completely different set of things. They are still feelings, but they, are, they might generate happiness for you, but what do they do? They take usually from some other area of your life's happiness, including your own health. So therefore they're not really if you measure everything with regard to addiction, it's not happy and out happy outcome. Even if you think it is happy from an emotional perspective, there's diseases that get created in your body which now cause you to be unhappy. Right? And what I'm suggesting is that true compensation, as God gives it, tells us happy, tells us we're unhappy by giving compensatory effects in both directions so that you can measure your harmony with love. Now, if God didn't provide a mechanism by which you could measure your harmony with love, wouldn't that be quite cruel in some ways? You'd never know when you're loving, you'd never know when you're unloving, you'd never know why some pain exists and why other pain does not exist. You'd, you'd never know anything, actually, about your life in terms of what creates happiness. So can you see the love principles are very much about God giving you an opportunity to be happy 
You see, when, when often when you guys are thinking about love, you're thinking about, oh, you know, there's principles involved, enforcing love and, you know, I, I, I'm having to work against my, you know, real feelings of what I want to do. And what I'm suggesting to you is, no, God knows what's going to make you happy. In fact, he created a whole series of laws. In fact, the highest principle in the universe um, happens to be there just to inform you what's going to make you happy and what isn't. So that's a demonstration of love from God to you, personal love. All right, so if we just examine in conclusion, so love principles are impossible for humans to apply fully without receiving God's love. Now we can see that because God's love being the pinnacle of love, the infinite source of love, obviously if all I'm going to have is a finite love that comes from myself or even worse, I have a finite love that is my definition of love that actually isn't love, Right? If that's all I'm going to have, then obviously it's going to be impossible for me to apply the love principle in my day-to-day -day life. So obviously receiving God's love is important. It ensures a purposeful existence and happiness for all creation. See, the love principle ensures that you'll end up happy. <laughs> Isn't that good? No matter how bad you think badly you do things and badly you treat other people and whatever else eventually because of this principle it's going to get you to realize all that and you'll end up happy even though you've had a bad time getting there you'll end up there right so that's what it lets us do and unfortunately they are the principles that most people on earth oppose or ignore like the very thing that's going to make you happy is the very thing we ignore. And instead we engage our addictions, which is a very unloving process. And we'll talk about them a bit more later. They're also the principles we've been teaching you for ever since I've met you, right? And probably, if you think about it, they're still the principles you have some of the most trouble with in terms of applying in your day-to-day -day life. And you will continue to do so until you receive some of God's love and actually act in harmony with it. Yep. So there's our love principles. Let's go on to our truth principles. So the truth principles, remember, last group we said, joined at the hip, Siamese twins, love and truth. What we're really saying here is that love cannot exist without truth and truth cannot exist without love. In fact, truth forms a framework in which love can exist. If, if tr truth provides a fixed framework, when I say a fixed framework, a fixed definition of laws and principles, and I'm not saying that that doesn't allow for expansion because it certainly does, but it provides a framework in which love can flow and be consistent. Because if love is not consistent, it's no longer love. Do you follow that principle? If, I, if, if, if something's not permanent and consistent and actually repeatable, then it's not love really, is it? Love is something that is steadfast and it stays the same under the same conditions. And if that didn't happen, it would be quite cruel, wouldn't it? Because one moment you'd feel some love and you wouldn't know why, and the other moment you'd feel like terrible and you don't know why, that would be... That would be directly out of harmony with happiness and therefore out of harmony with love, wouldn't it? So the truth principles provide a framework for love to exist. So let's have a look at it. Truth principles envelop God's truth, just like love principles envelop God's love. Truth principles envelop God's truth around each creation principle and law. Remember, so, so you could say love envelops the emotion. So remember back in our... First talk, we talked about God's ways, forms of communication, emotion. The primary emotion that God communicates with is love. Right? And truth principles, which are all based around mass, mathematics, yeah? This is why these have become the two primary ways in which God communicates. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the truth principles do that. So truth is inseparably joined with love. Without mathematical certainty, emotions cannot flow with certainty. 
So then, then, you, then it's hit and miss. Imagine that. One day you engage something that makes you happy and the next day you do exactly the same thing but it makes you sad. <laughs> How confusing would that be? There needs to be some predictability, does there not? In order for love to really exist. And the mathematics, the mathematical certainty and predictability, the precise nature of truth, means that it forms a framework through which the emotion of love can be experienced predictably, with certainty. If I can continue, I'm, I'm not going to go through much questions here, guys, so sorry. Truth is enforced and compelled. Just like love is enforced and compelled, so too truth is enforced and compelled. In fact, truth, that's what truth is. The enforcement and compulsion of every single law, every single principle has to be governed by this one principle. Mathematical certainty. Without mathematical certainty, love, can't, love is not even possible because it becomes unpredictable and anything unpredictable would be uncertain and therefore one moment create happiness and the other moment create something opposite. This would be terrible for us in our existence if that happened. So you can see it forms the framework for which love can exist. It's a framework of mathematical, scientific, spiritual and emotional fact. So we're not adverse to seeing mathematical fact when it comes to the physical universe, are we? We're not adverse to seeing, oh, there's mathematical formulas that dictate this particular action or this, this particular reaction, this particular gravitational pull, this particular thing. In fact, scientists for many years now have, have known these laws so well that they can create craft that go to the moon and back, for example, and who knows what they're working on now, probably working on craft to go further, and with certainty because they, it's based on these facts, right? So we, we understand fact does apply to mathematical scientific fact, does apply to the physical universe. We understand that. But when it comes to our emotional life and it comes to our spiritual life, we don't believe it's true anymore. Now, I, t I say to you that's an illogical supposition. The reality is the fact that mathematical and scientific fact exists in the physical means that it must also exist in the emotional and spiritual. Right? And it does. And without it, you would not be able to maintain any consistent emotion and you would not be able to maintain any consistent belief. So imagine one day you wake up in the morning and you believe in God, the next day you wake up in the morning and you don't. One day you wake up in the morning and you believe you love your partner who's lying next to you, and the next day you wake up and who's she? <laughs> That's how it would be without this. Because emotional fact can exist all the time. So you, if you fall in love, as the saying goes, which is an emotion, with another person, you wake up the next day, it's not like that emotion has now disappeared, right? Because there is some facts involved with the flow of that emotion and it still continues to flow. It only stops flowing when those facts are no longer satisfied. Right? And the same applies to spiritual belief systems. Imagine you go to sleep one day and you, you believe you're a Muslim, you wake up the next day and you're a Christian. How confusing would that be? It's like, there has to be some certainty that you're going to sort of wake up in the same state you finished off in, isn't it? Otherwise it would be so confusing, like you'd be going around in constant days, wouldn't you? Wondering what in the hell's just gone on with my day today. And imagine it, even worse than that would be that you can't remember yesterday. <laughs> that would be even worse again, wouldn't it? If you couldn't remember the belief you had yesterday that you now have today that would be terrible because that means you can't remember the emotion you had yesterday and you can't remember the thoughts you had yesterday so if all these things weren't fact there is no consistency in the entire universe what are we then we have no ability to even have a free will or ability to think for ourselves or, or make decisions or choices anymore all of that becomes null and void now if we don't understand how much these truth principles affect your life, right? Besides the fact that if you live in harmony, out of harmony with truth, you break every law. <laughs> every law. 
Now, for most of you, that has yet to really hit you because you're still thinking that you can live in a facade, which is actually breaking this law or principle of truth. And you think you can live in a facade with no consequence. But all of these laws have consequence. Right? Truth provides precision and certainty in the framework of creation. Can you see from the examples I've given how that's the case? Isn't it wonderful it does? Imagine life without it. It would be a, a, a terrible life on a lot of levels. You'd be in fear constantly. But not only that, you might not even remember what caused you to be in the fear yesterday. So you'll actually engage the activity again today that causes the same fear as it caused yesterday the same pain that it caused yesterday, there's no, there'll be no predictability. Very, very damaging for your existence, actually, without the principle existing. So these, these principles are so essential to your very existence. To your very existence. Again, let's uh, look at gravity. So it's scientifically measurable. So as we said, gravity, if we just get rid of our... Correlations here. So gravity, if I can just lock in that bottom of that so it stops moving. Thanks, Connie. Is it just me pushing too hard? No, that's good. Thanks, man. So gravity, 9.8 metres per second squared. Metres per second squared. If, if that wasn't happening and it wasn't predictable, imagine our life. We'd, you know, like I said to the previous group, you're walking, you're, so you're walking. You're reliant on gravity to pull you down with a certain force. So, you know, when you have that spring in your step and you're walking, right? What would happen if one moment there was less gravity, you'd be going along like this, and then all of a sudden you go, fly up in the air, and, <laughs> you know, and the next moment you go, oh, squashed to the ground, and you couldn't do anything about it. And, and before you knew it, one moment you'd be taking a stride, and all of a sudden it's like five strides, <laughs> right? You start running and you're running along and all of a sudden now you're doing like five times the speed right? and high and, and your own physical form can't be maintained at a certain speed, of course, and you hit something, you're in trouble, right? The human body can only sustain, what is it about? I think it's about 10 Gs of force, 10 times this force of gravity before it completely collapses. So imagine that you know you'd be running along bang you hit, you hit into things and you're dead straight away how inconsistent is that not only that it's scientifically measurable so that means that i can predict what it's going to do as a force i can predict it so imagine if gravity changed and you were flying well, one moment the force of gravity would be so much and the next moment the force of gravity would be half that. The plane would all of a sudden jump into the, <laughs> into the air like thousands of metres all at once and of course the forces on the plane would be too strong to handle that and it would just collapse right there just from that one force changing not being predictable. Right, it's just like gravity is a scientifically measurable mathematical fact that I can put my trust in for the rest of my existence. And if I couldn't, life would be so <laughs> unpredictable, not only unpredictable, but my own life would not be able to be sustained. I couldn't even live. Right? So it lets me use the law with certainty. And I don't even have to know that much about the law to use it with certainty. Isn't that a great thing too? I don't have to know that it's 9.8 metres per second squared and I don't have to make all these calculations. If I make this stride, how far am I going to go? I'm not sure. Let's work it out. 9.8 <laughs> metres per second by blah, 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 blah. And, and we don't have to do all that, right? Because the force is consistent. We now can even feel its force and we then judge our actions through this connection with feeling and we don't even need to know the mathematics behind it or make calculations about it anymore. Right? Clever system. Clever system. God, God's very clever, right? Understatement. Aerodynamics. The law defines the primary conditions for flight. So how does aerodynamics work? Well, remember we said there were four forces. What do you think one of them must be? Well, 
Well, obviously, one's pulling things down, isn't it? So, so what, what, what do you call that? It's weight, isn't it? Lift, thrust, and... Well, thrust is power. Yeah? Air resistance. What's that called? Drag. Through a fluid, there's always drag. You know, the fluid is pulling you back, trying to make you stop. In other words, you've got a form of momentum that's trying to pull you back. And then there's uh, three ways of controlling it. Do you know what they are? There's roll, right? Then there's this down and up movement. What what they call that? Do you know? No, your is. Uh, side by side like that. So your and pitch, yeah. All right. So now we have a way because of the consistencies of the law. We now have a way to actually control a device that we create that uses these principles to maintain height and therefore predictability. Now, if those laws didn't exist, wow, well, you know. We wouldn't even get off the ground, would we? If, if one of those laws didn't exist. Okay, so the law defines the primary conditions for flight and once understood, I can build a, desire, a device that engages these three methods of control. <coughs> Allows me to fly in that device. If they weren't predictable, or they didn't exist, then we couldn't engage the law of aerodynamics. All right. All right. So there's aerodynamics. What else have we got? The physical properties of substance. We've already had a look at that in that previous example that I gave Lani in the question she asked in the fundamental facts Q&A. Remember that? Where we said, we had hydrogen, oxygen, and they are elements that can be combined. And in fact, actually, there are all sorts of creations that can be combined. But there are laws that govern how different creations are combined, and there's laws that govern how different types of creations can be combined. So in other words, you can't combine oxygen with a human genome and get oxidized human genome. <laughs> right? it has to, the oxygen has to combine at the elemental level in order for it to combine with something else. It can't combine at a genetic level. It does form the basis of the genetic structure. It's one of the elements, one of the five or six con basic elements that form a gene, uh, the structure of the genome. But you can't do it through a com combination at different levels. It has to be done at the elemental level. So this law is controlling that too, obviously. But here we have hydrogen and oxygen. When they combine, because oxygen has always got a specific properties, it's always got specific ways of operation, it's always got specific things in which it can exist, it always is going to combine in the same way with other elements of, you know, sim of a type, of a certain type, it's of, or of the same types, it's going to combine the same ways. Now, of course, the, the amount of combinations that can occur, theoretically, would be infinitesimal. Infinite, would that not be the case? Not infinitesimal. And, and the, the beauty of that is that it means that uh, uh, elements, basic elements, can combine to form higher creatures or higher substances, living or non-living, and, and form the basis of systems as well. Because the physical property of the substance is consistent. If the truth principle didn't exist, one day oxygen would do one thing and the next day it would do something else. So one day you have water, the next day you don't. Next day you have a poisonous subject, you drink it and <laughs> you cark it, you know. This is a potential if it was inconsistent, right? But because it's consistent, every day it's the same. Beautiful. I can rely on that. I can do things with that. I can base the life on that. I am safe. 
Truth principles create safety in God's universe. So this whole concept that you're unsafe, <laughs> which is a fear, is not really true because the reality is all of God's laws are trying to create your safety. The only, the only thing that can be different to that is it uses without a harmony. That is what? Ah, the human using its desire. That's what creates a lack of safety. And if you think about the things you're afraid of the most, probably most of them involve humans in some way or the other. Uh, even a snake, why are you safe, uh, unsafe, feel unsafe with that? Because mummy or daddy removed love from you in, as a childhood when you saw one. Right? It's got nothing to do with the snake even. Even that's a demonstration of human involved. Now we've got a different outcome because the will of the human is now being used out of harmony with these principles. Yep. So each substance of the same kind has the same truth. Has the same truth. So I know that with mathematical certainty that when you have an emotion of anger, it's a certain, it's a certain formula and it's the same formula in each person. Does that make sense? If you have a thought to harm something, it's a certain formula. Same formula, depending on what you want to harm, it's the same formula in each person. So now God's laws can measure the energy and the intensity of the energy and the type of energy that flows within your soul which now creates the mechanism by which laws can affect the soul itself. Uh, all based because, all because of the truth principle. If the truth principle didn't exist, that would not be possible. Yeah. Just got to check on my time. Right. Um, right. Well, we need to skip to our conclusion. So let's just look at our conclusion. So truth principles are impossible for humans to understand without receiving God's love. Again, ensure existence and harmony and predictability for all creation. You can see that. They ensure fearlessness, security and safety. And that's cool, eh? It's fantastic that we can live in a safe environment and God's creating one through this principle. And unfortunately, they are the principles that are most often ignored. And you know what? In your Q&As, and the first group's Q&A, what do you think was the principle that was asked the least amount of questions about? Truth. What does that tell us? That we have a huge amount of blockages still to the concept of truth. Yeah, we don't understand it. We don't understand its importance in our life. And if you look at your life personally, can you see that? Still acting out of harmony with truth a lot of the days, right? And even out of harmony with the truth of what you feel. You're acting out of harmony with that, right? You're also often um, presenting a facade of who you are. That's acting out of harmony with this principle, isn't it? Yeah. So this is an area where the majority of us need to do a lot of understanding work. This truth principle. We don't understand, most of us have this concept that love is love and truth is truth. And you can lie if you love, you can tell fibs, you can make out things. It's good for love if you do that. And as soon as we believe these things, we are way out of harmony with love, God's version of love. Because God's version of love is basically saying, unless you're truthful, you're also not loving unless one exists, one cannot exist without the other. That's what God's saying. Unfortunately, many of us still have this feeling that they two are separate. We can separate them. We can say one and not the other. We can do one and not the other. We can be one and not the other. And it's impossible. You're just fooling yourselves if you believe that. So very good principles to understand. So our Next session, which is only 30 minutes long, 
and it, there's no break. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a quick changeover, myself and Lena. It'll take a few seconds, maybe 30, and then we'll get started on the Q&A for Love and Truth Principles. The session now is Love and Truth Principles, Question and Answers. Um, can I start uh, with you, Eloisa, your second question? Can I go to Karen Henry and your second question? So if we can use both mics on the side as well. Yep. Um, All right. So, Eloisa, Love Principles, second question. Yep. Is it by receiving love that we understand love? It's not that one. Another one? What's the difference? Oh, you might have put truth principles on a love. I think that because it, it has a love and truth question, like it involves both, was it? Do you want to just tell me? With love and truth compelling you is the oh. question. Many of you have asked this question, so I just wanted to... Um, sorry, I'm lost. Remember we said in our pr principle that love and truth oh. are enforced and compelled so um, this is the one about how it compels you to love or to be truthful and do the loving thing. Does it get to a point where it feels impossible to do anything but love and but be truthful? Yes, it does. But. Yep. Um, the reality is the human desire is very, very strong and has a very big power. Yep. And if you as a person decide inside of your soul and then act upon this desire, decision and exercise a desire to suppress what the love and truth is telling you to do, yep. then you won't do it. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so the reality is it does get to a point where it feels impossible to do anything but love with one caveat, and the caveat is unless you are desensitised emotionally. Okay. If you desensitise emotionally, and this is what many of you do, you desensitise emotionally, you are now not sensitive to what the love is telling you to do. And you're not sensitive to what the truth is telling you to do. As a result, you now have a high possibility and likelihood of acting out of harmony because of your desensitisation towards truth and love. Now remember there's the two issues. There's the mathematical certainty involved in the truth issue and there's the emotional issue involved in the love issue. So what's this, what this is telling us is this, if we desensitise our soul to emotion, we automatically also have the subsequent result of desensitising our soul to truth and love. Now, the truth and love that may exist within our soul doesn't have the ability to be expressed anymore because we're suppressing it. And this is where most of us are. We're, we're suppressing what the truth and love is telling us to do. Now, as you receive more and more of God's love, the reality is that God's love is a very powerful force, far powerful than any human love. So therefore, once it enters you, the, ins the insistence of the love that now exists within you is harder to ignore. To ignore it requires a greater amount of exercise of force, desire. Now, this is the state where most of the 14 are still in. Because they've received a large amount of God's love in the soul, they're, they're exercising a large force to suppress its operation. Does that make sense? To engage unloving behaviour requires a large force and therefore also a larger consequence. A harmful consequence. So because the love in us as a first incarnation is not as great because we haven't received all of that love, we're yep. still doing the same thing, but it's just to a lesser degree. Yes. So i give you an example of that for me. Thank you. If I, like, you'll see this sometimes in my body. If I suppress something, like at the moment I'm still su I'm suppressing some fear quite a lot, right? I've been doing it for probably last year or so. I'm still resistive to even knowing what it is, right? So, but I'm still working through trying to develop a desire to know what it is even, right? But since the time that I've been aware that I've, I've suppressed my, my, this, this feeling, I've gotten grey sort of overnight. Does that make sense? But you notice my skin is still much the same, but I've gotten grey. Well, you know, this grey is appearing in my... And it's not like I'm grey fully, obviously, but, you know, you, I'm, I'm getting grey. Now, that never happened before. 
And I know why it's happening. It's just because I'm suppressing something. So if, if one of the 14 suppresses something, they'll get a disease very rapidly. They can create a, a problem very rapidly. In, in one of the 14's case, they created their own murder very rapidly, actually, right? through the choices they made. Within a month of making a choice, they were dead. That's how rapidly it can occur. Right? That's not quite as normal for the average person on the planet because there's, there's less suppression that has to occur. Right? But the big issue is suppression of emotion. That's the big issue. We've got to learn every time we suppress an emotion, there's going to be the negative consequence, demonstrating that the suppression of emotion is out of harmony with love. It's also out of harmony with truth because we're not acting in harmony with the emotion that's in us, so it's also out of harmony with truth. That's a big problem. Yeah. Can we go to your next question? Sorry, have you closed your book there? So Eloise will get so involved in the question she forgets where she is. Sorry about <laughs> that's that. Right, Taking your time up. <laughs> that's, um, a, that's a good thing. Okay, so is this the um, one about all creation demonstrates? Yes. yes. All creation dem this is really your question. Yes. Well, um, all creation demonstrates and facilitates the flow of God's principled love. Yes. Would you please explain this further and what principled love actually is? Yeah, many of you have asked that question, so I need to answer it. Okay, so principled love. There's a difference between personal love and principled love. All right? Personal love uh, is, uh, you could call affection. Yep. Could you not? Yeah. And we call it affection. There's different types of affection too, isn't there? You know, the Greeks used to have different words for the different types of affection. Erotic affection, it was eros. You know, brotherly affection, philia. Fil 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 uh, fil 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 and uh, affection of family, storge. Right? But, but there are different types of affection, but we'll just call them affection. Principled love is where you love something because it's right to do so. Does that make sense? So this is about what is truth. Hmm. It's right, what is right, morally and ethically. So when you're being immoral or unethical, you're being unprincipled with your love. You're out of harmony with God's principled love. Now the question was, like, how does all creation demonstrate the flow of principled love? Well, all creation is based upon truth, ethics and morality. Right? Everything in creation has a role based on one of these things. Everything is balanced in some way. And, and these principles... The, and, and the Greeks used to call it agape love, is a, a principled love, a love based on what is the right thing to do. Now, what I'm suggesting is a lot, all of creation demonstrates to you what the right thing to do is. So I'll give you an example. You go to a block of land and you strip it bare. Right? We've had the example nearby where you live, right, where people have just come along and stripped the bear, right? Every creature dies. Every supportive system dies. A lot of the insects die. A lot of the mechanisms, the intelligence in the property dies. Uh, so it's all stripped bare, it all, all just dies. That has a subsequent result on the other f creations in that area. Now, it also has, a, ironically, a result upon our, even our breathing and all sorts of things like that, even the oxygen production and all sorts of things. Now, it demonstrates the principle that if you take away these systems from our planet, yeah. you are going to cause degradation of multiple f life forms. You follow? Yeah. It demonstrates that principle. Yeah. There's an example of principled love being demonstrated through or, or being, you know, out of harmony. Out of harmony and, but it's still demonstrating the truth yeah. that if I brought my life into more principled harmony with the environment around me, my life will benefit. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. An example of principled love being demonstrated through the law. 
So principled love is more along the lines of God's love, whereas uh, personal love is more along natural love, would that? No, no, because God has personal love for you. Okay. So, so the reality is you can have a personal love you have for Pete, but let's say, is there anybody here you don't know, Eloisa, that you've not met yet? Who hasn't met Eloisa yet? Well, I met them all on the way in, but I don't know them yet. <laughs> yeah, who doesn't know Eloisa? Just put up your hand. Yeah. Well, you can still love those people, even yeah. though you don't know them. Yeah. That's principled love. Okay. It's yep. love based on the fact that they're equal to you. Yep. They have the same, of, you know, they have the same, from God's perspective, they, they, are, they, they are not superior or inferior to you. Yep. And that's based, a love based on principle for them. And so my affection would grow as I got to know them. Of course. Your right. personal love, yep. the affection, only can grow if you get to know them. All right. That's the difference between the two forms of love. So God's uh, universe, all of the creatures and everything else in God's universe that, that is not a human soul, so that's every other creation, demonstrates God's principled love in some way. And it's only you, the highest of all creation, that is capable of a oh. conscious personal affection. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks heaps. Yep. Yep. And that's why we've called it the principled love in the, in the outline. All right, now we've got to skip to some truth issues, but I will uh, answer Karen. So can we go to Karen? You've got the mic there, Karen. Uh, your second question, Karen. Uh, how does non-living matter experience God's love? Right. So can you see from this discussion now that we had with Eloisa that here we have a principled love, which, by the way, you can either have, you can have a principled love coming from you, but God would also have a principled love coming from God. So God has these two forms of love too, a principled love and a personal affection. You follow? Now what we're saying is that all non-living matter experiences God's love. Of course it's not aware of the experience because it is, has an incapacity to be aware, but it still experiences it. Because without the love existing in each of the of all matter, the matter would never be in harmony, and therefore we'd never be able to create new things from matter that currently exists. Mm -hmm. We'd never have rules and principles that guide its its commingling, its convergence. So God's principle love exists in all creation. Right from the smallest particle to you, in fact, and in fact. The way it exists in you is that you can become the perfect natural man. And that, that's only possible because God's principled love exists. Right? But becoming the divine angel is all about God's personal love existing and being received by you. Right? Which is a different process, obviously. Mm -hmm. yeah? But all matter, all non-living matter experiences God's personal love. Example. You have, a, you have a building like this, right? It's created from all sorts of things, you know. Isn't it? Wood, metal, all these other things are all created, this, this place. But they're all dead. So they're all non-living matter, aren't they? Yes. Okay. Now, if God's love didn't exist, this matter would not consistently exist. So you wouldn't be able to build a house. Right? But not only that... All the living creatures are trying to eat this matter and all of God's even chemicals that God creates are trying to de decompose this matter so that it can be turned into something that supports a life form, mm -hmm. a living life form. So that's another demonstration of how principled love exists within all matter even if it's non-living. If there wasn't the processes of the life principle which are all governed by, by this principle of love, then, then unfortunately, none of these processes of decomposition could occur. And if decomposition can't occur, then support of new life can't occur. Mm -hmm. right, so, demonstration again of God's principled love. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yep. Thank you. We can come up with hundreds of, of thousands, millions of examples, but there's just a few there. Now, let's try and find uh, something about truth now. Let's me just... So you had so many good questions about love, by the way. I'm sorry I can't answer them all. We're trying to get some to some truth ones. Um, Pierre, 
If we go to Pierre and Nikki up the back. Um, could we start with Nikki? Sorry, Pierre. We'll start with Nikki's question because it sort of leads things. So, Kay. thanks, Nikki. All the truth principles applied to law to lead us all ultimately to love and God's love if we seek it. Yeah. You, you can see that if the truth principles didn't exist, then no consistency would exist. And if no consistency exists, how would you ever discover love? You wouldn't. Because the emotion of love wouldn't even exist consistently. Right? Remember, um, the emotion is based upon a mathematical force that, or an energy that is mathematically defined. So the emotion of love is actually a mathematical calculation based on any, uh, of flow, a certain type of energy that can be defined mathematically. And if that definition mathematically did not exist, then how would you ever discover it? You couldn't. So, so you can see why love and truth is so Im important together. Without, without truth, even love can't really function or exist. It can't flow. It can't, you, know, you wouldn't be able to measure it. You wouldn't be able to feel it. You wouldn't be able to pass through your soul. You wouldn't be able to experience it. Yeah. So the reality also is that ultimately the truth principle is what leads you to love. And this is why I said to people in the first century, keep on seeking first the truth. Or, or I said, seek the truth. Right? Because it's so important to seek truth. And yet, you know what I see? Like last night's an example where I give you some truth and most of you shut down. You're not seeking truth. If it was me there, I would have gone, am I part of this group or am I part of that group? What part group am I a part of? Can you tell me, like, you know, I'd be asking all these questions about what's going on and what, what, how it's working and all those kind of things. But none of you decided to do that. Instead, you all start getting shut down, get depressed about it. You know, not really functioning even about it. And then, and then what I notice, you walk outside, engage your addictions, and you're lively again. That's an illustration of you not understanding how important this truth principle is to your life, right? You should have a real, like, investigative enthusiasm for it, for truth, rather than this, oh, oh, oh. When you walked in the door last night, many of you were nervous. What's that called? Fear. What's fear? False. Expectations appearing real. What is it? The opposite of truth. You weren't in a state of truth when you walked in the door. You didn't want it. That's why you're afraid. If you wanted truth, you'd walk in the door going, Oh, you river, I'm here. <laughs> Give it to me. You know what I mean? That's how you'd feel. And you'd go out and hug this person, hug that person. I'm so glad to see you. You know, I'm so glad to be here. How about you? This is how you'd feel. But because of the fear that exists within, which is out of harmony with this truth principle, you don't feel that way. Therefore, you don't express love. The two go hand in hand, right? So you can develop some enthusiasm for things this way. All right, let's move on to Pierre. Can we have Pierre? Um, can we have your question number one, even though I've uh, really explained it before? Because I just want to spend a bit more time on it. Can you explain God's truth? is a framework for the expression of love. Right. Now, so by now, as a group, you should be starting to see that without truth, love really can't exist, even as an emotion. There's no mathematical framework in which the emotion of love could exist if truth doesn't exist. Right. So by now, you should be seeing how it forms the framework. It provides the mathematical framework in which an emotion can flow therefore provides the framework for love to actually exist. And these different types of love are even measurable. God, they're, they're different formulas, right? They're different mathematical formulas, so therefore they're measurable. So God knows when you have a personal love for him, and God also knows when you're just doing things because you think it's right. right. So if you're just doing things with God that you think is right, while well, God thinks that's a good thing, it's still not a personal relationship with God. It's just based on principle. And God knows that. God measures that. So when we talk about having a sincere, heartfelt longing for God, compared to just a sincere desire to do the right thing, God measures the difference between those two things. 
Makes sense, huh? And as a result of that, he will respond in one way to one thing. So in this way, he might respond with approval, but not by giving his personal love. His personal love has to come from a desire. There's laws that govern its operation. And the truth principles form the framework of those laws that govern the operation. So without the truth principles, you, without these truth principles, you couldn't even receive God's love. There'd be no way inside of your soul for you to get it in there. Uh, there has to be a framework. There has to be laws, properties within your soul that have to exist to allow God's love to enter it. Makes sense, right? Can God then measure love mathematically? All love is mathematical. Yeah. 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 Just like all other emotions are mathematical and can be mathematically defined. Yeah. Your next question. Can we do that one as well? And then we'll have to finish. Why that that truth principles seem more easily to grasp and understand that love principles? To me at least. <laughs> I mean to understand how loving they are. Has it to do with the emotion of rebellion against love? Yeah, I don't know if I could agree with this question of yours in, in the way that you've framed it. Because I feel the majority of people have more misunderstanding about truth principles and, uh, than love principles, and in particular don't understand how truth is the framework of love. So, so why I feel the main reason why we don't understand love is because you, you don't embrace truth. That's the main reason why you don't understand love. Once you embrace truth, you start getting love a lot better. Right? You start understanding that every time I lie, every time I misrepresent, every time I withhold, every time I'm not expressing myself uh, truthfully, every time I'm withholding my true emotional state, I'm acting out of harmony with love, not just with truth, acting out of harmony with love. So, so I, I don't know, I feel that both principles seem to be very difficult for humanity to grasp because humanity does not get that truth and love are married. They've merged, that they can't exist without each other. Humanity wants to believe that you can love something and at the same time lie. God's, God's principles say that's impossible. You're not loving it anymore. It's not, it's not love anymore. So, so I feel this is our, our main problem uh, with regard to these two principles, is that we don't understand that the two principles require each other in order to function. Right? And most of us believe we can love without being truthful. We do. And that demonstrates we do not understand God's version of love. God's version of love is that you cannot love without being truthful. You cannot. Impossible. That's God's version of love. So we need to grasp that. And once you start grasping that, ironically, that's also when you'll start receiving some of God's love because reception of God's love is based upon understanding some basic truths about its reception. In fact, the Holy Spirit itself, which is the mechanism by which love is received, is based on truth. You can't even have a connection with God unless in that moment you were in a state of truth. Right? And so this is why it's so important to get the, that these two principles are together. And I still feel that that's something that the majority of people listening to divine truth are ignoring. Right? They're still ignoring this fundamental fact about how God made the universe, and that is that truth and love cannot exist in isolation. So it's a good question because it helps me say that statement again. <laughs> Thanks for that. All right, well now we have to come to our completion of our love and truth principles. After the uh, break that we have, we're going to be discussing life and development principles, which of course are going to have facets of love and truth built into them, as you can imagine. And, uh, but that will happen. Uh, let's, can we come back at 5 to 2? Five minutes to two. Thanks, guys. Thank you.